Good evening. My name is Vinita Shetty, and I am the convener of Placemaking India, a self organized network of urban professionals linked to Placemaking X in New York. I'm also curator of Urban Jam, which is a regular online dialogue between Desi placemakers and the Indic diaspora of urban professionals. Today is Pakistan's Independence Day and uh, the eve of India's Independence Day. Also that back in 1947, the last British Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten of Burma, could attend the ceremonies in both Pakistan and India. To mark the occasion, we welcome you all to a very special conversation of mutual discovery, one that is not only cross-border, across a very fraught border, but also cross-generational. Young Lahori urban artist will find common ground with a veteran architect who's lived and worked near Old Delhi for most of his time. Two speakers with strong place attachment to the historic old cause of their cities. Pakistani journalist Sara Hamid, who lived in both cities, beloved to the Mughals, always imagined the Delhi Gate in Lahore and the Lahore Gate in Delhi to be linked portals. I fantasize about walking through the gate in Lahore and ending up in Delhi. It feels that way too, she says. She also says Delhi and Lahore have a relationship akin to that of two sisters torn apart by a catastrophic family episode. Jinne Lahore nahi vekya, wo janmiya nahi. He who has not seen Lahore, he has not been born yet was an expression we heard of the fabled city in the Punjab province, a place which is only half an hour in time and 420 kilometers in driving distance from Delhi, but exists only in the imagination for most Indians. It was only in London, about 6,000 kilometers away, that many Indians like myself may first sample the best of Lahori cuisine. It remains to be seen if Delhi's Choli Bhaturi will stand up to Lahore's Nihari and Paya, but food culture is as strong in Shahjanabad as it is in Anarkali Bazaar, and it's intrinsic to placemaking initiatives that we'll be hearing in a moment. Placemaking revives the walled city's pride in their own significance, their joys, and their attractions. And I hope this conversation, steered by Placemaking India founding member Sanjay Prakash of SHIFT, Studio for Habitat Futures, will also demonstrate that old Delhi, like old Lahore, cannot be merely preserved. It is living heritage and needs to grow. Our moderator, Sanjay Prakash, is an architect with a commitment to energy conscious architecture, eco friendly design, people's participation in planning, music, and production design. And over the years, he's integrated all his work with the practice of new urbanism and sustainability in his professional and personal life. He's principal consultant of his design firm, Shift Studio for Habitat Futures, and co founder of Future Institute and Himalayan Institute for Alternatives, Ladakh and also senior advisor, Indian Institute for Human Settlements. He's involved with leading the team that is master planning the sustainable smart campus of Indian Institute of Technology in Jodhpur, the campus of the Bamboo Research and Training Center in Chandrapur, Maharashtra. And he has also mentored the Future Institute to be a knowledge partner for the Municipal Corporation of Gurgaon for the rejuvenation of urban ponds in Gurgaon. Uh, besides that, the Future Institute is working on an industrial ecopolis uh, research in real estate, affordable housing, a new university being planned in Ladakh, livable cities, and PPPP initiatives in Zamrutpur, a no neighborhood in South Delhi. Sanjay Prakash's name and work is mentioned in the 20th edition of one uh, for major reference work in architectural history, the history of architecture by Sir Bannister Fletcher. So over to you, Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you, Vinita. Thanks a lot. And uh, also thank you for what I believe is a really big honor on such an auspicious day to be moderating two excellent speakers who are so much in love with their places um, that I just feel overwhelmed. I just don't know whether my role is that of a timekeeper or a uh, um, compiler of the questions that will arise as these speakers speak. But anyway, let me get on with my task of at least introducing the two speakers. So Ashok, Ashok Lal is a very eminent Delhi-based architect 
who lives in civil lines very near kashmiri gate not so much lahori gate but kashmiri gate and uh, is very strongly committed towards elements of sustainable architecture much as i am uh, he's been a collaborator a colleague and a senior at the same time and uh, he has <clears throat> i've personally known him for a long long time and i find that of late he has been interested in uh, putting his claws into urbanism specifically in malviya nagar in south of delhi where he's been working with participatory methods to create new kinds of places uh, in a way that can be ecologically sustainable at the same time so ashok i just just hang on let me introduce asba also i don't know asba personally in fact i'm meeting her for the first time on screen now uh but having read her cv i can say for sure that she is lahori through and through and an extremely enthusiastic young architect who has founded peace making in uh, peace making pakistani which is an organization which is committed towards social causes related to place making uh, and uh, in that sense uh, i would be quite eager to learn of the story of the the kila in uh, lahore as well as the lal kila in uh, in delhi from ashok both of which by the way are unesco world heritage sites and both of them also contain if you look up google images as i have been doing in the last two or three hours both of them also contain a, a very large mosque though not the largest in the case of the uh, badshahi masjid i think it's called in in lahore the jama masjid is or was historically the largest for many many decades <clears throat> many centuries actually but both are such similar places that it would not be wrong to call them sisters i'm also very happy to see that there are as many as 73 guests who have joined us i hope from both nations judging by some names yes i can see that they are from both nations and i hope uh you have a good time on the eve of pakistan independence day on on the eve of india's independence day and on pakistan's independence day so um uh you both speakers have tentatively 15 minutes but i will not interrupt you till about 18 or 20 minutes uh, at which point i will start getting into my role as time keeper and with that i would invite ashok ashok lal to share his screen and start the presentations over to you ashok thank you sanjay and i am now going to share my screen i'm going to ask you if you can all see it yes we can, can. you can Oh, what's happened is that the eyes have to minimize this part. Right. So here we are, remembering you, Lahore, and here's me with my Begum Sahiba Ain, taking a selfie in the newly reclaimed Changni Chowk Street, with the Lal Kila in the background, from where the Prime Minister will address the nation tomorrow. Um, this is a great event for place making. starting its new journey in the city of delhi well as you all said just now vinita the prime minister will address the nation from on top of lahori darwaza of the lal kila and the lahori darwaza looks down the old street of chandni chowk which leads to chandni chowk itself flanking which is jahanara begum's sarai and behind that are the royal gardens this is old time shah jahanabad or delhi as i would like to call it 
And it goes on to Fatehpur Masjid, Fatehpuri Masjid, where it does a chess move of the Ghoda Chal, one to the right and two to the left, and reaches Lahore Darwaza. So here we have Delhi acknowledging it's her elder sister, Lahore, because Lahore predates Delhi. And you can now see that, well, the main mosque, Jama Masjid, is placed to one side because it was on a hillock, and the emperor would have a separate route uh, after Jama Masjid was built. He would come by the second gate on the bottom of Lal Kila, as against the Lahori Darwaza, which he used to use when Fatehpuri Masjid was the main masjid, which determined the main axis of the city. Well, after 87, after the Ghadar, British came and established themselves, took control, laid out the space under between Lal Kila and Jama Masjid, and built a new axis brought in the railway right into the heart of the walled city, occupying the gardens, believe it or not, and built a new axis that goes from the railway station to the town hall, intersects with Chandni Chowk, which is now halved, the chalk is practically halved, and they built a new nice sarak, which connects cutting across the old city to Chauri Bazaar at another kind of a small space that is created behind Jama Masjid. And so here we have the arrival of the British. Don't mistake the Union Jack colors uh, and the arrival of the New World, the railway station, the town, town hall, transport, modern utilities, and of course, security of the ruling establishment. Well, Delhi has grown. Delhi has grown enormously. Someone asked me who's a Diliwala. Well, a Diliwala is a person who lives, works in Delhi or who may have connections with the old Delhi historically in past few generations or has a deep interest in it. But this is now a minority. We know the Delhi Wallas are a minority. They've actually been overtaken by the new Delhi Wallas. New Delhi Wallas are the people who established themselves when the new capital city designed by Lakshans is built. And the new Delhi Wallas actually looked down upon the Delhi Wallas because they thought they were more superior because they were European, Anglicized and so on. They thought they were more superior, but even they actually are in our minority because the city has grown in leaps and bounds. And as you can see, it is surrounded on all sides by the new cohort who are the, the Delhiites. So now what do we call ourselves? We don't call ourselves Delhi Wallas or New Delhi Wallas. We call, them, call ourselves Delhiites. Delhiites are the majority. And as this map shows clearly, well, they have a tentative relationship with Delhi although Dildi is beginning to stake its claim again. And you see the signboard at the bottom? It recalls Shah Jahan Road, Shah Jahan Road, as part of New Delhi. And what do you see on this? You see the new pecking order. The name of the road is first announced in Hindi, then in English, and then, as a surprise, in Gurmukhi, the script of the Punjabi language. And then after that, you have Urdu at the bottom. So this really tells you what uh, the social, political pecking order of the day has now become. So the way I see it is that places gain significance in the cultural values of communities and society as large, at large as a layering of three realms of experience. There are memories of events and personalities embedded in the places of the city. There is the establishment of mythical geographies through the symbolism of the city spaces. And then there is, of course, the places of day-to-day -day living. It's these three layers that come together. And placemaking is the appropriation of this physical realm by a shared imagination, which then begins to shower affectionate care on that place. So going back in history, when the Mughal Empire is at its end, Bahadur Shah is the last emperor, that is when, interestingly, the best of the poets of Delhi, the Urdu poets of Delhi, flower. Soda, Mirdad, Miktakhimir, Ghalib, Zafar, Zok, 
room, and these are a few, but these are the famous ones. And we know where they lived in the city. Ghalib Zaveli is still around and it's being made into a museum. So these are embedded and they can be remembered. And coming closer to our times, the time of independence, we have Jawaharlal Nehru wearing Kamla Haksar at the Haksar Haveli in the middle of the old city. Beautiful Haveli it was, it's no longer there. And you have Muhammad Ali Jinnah launching Dawn newspaper at Pucha Chelan. Pucha Chelan, where some of the great poets and intellectuals lived uh, at the turn of the century. And then of course, that culture continued later on. And here we see the big events of the city, the big community and religious events of the city. At the time of Eid prayers, at the bottom left of the picture, you'll see from Patepuri Masjid, people are spilling out onto Chandni Chowk Street, occupying the street for quite a distance, all participating in the same prayer. And also at Jama Masjid, which is a much bigger space, you still spill out onto the steps on the three sides of Jama Masjid. So you begin to occupy parts of the city outside the precincts of the mosque for the event. And when it comes to Muharram and the Tazia procession, it starts at Kalam Hill, skirts around Jama Masjid, goes down Chauri Bazaar, comes to Ajmeri Gate, crosses over and goes south to a fabled Karbala. Again, it's a kind of creation of a mythical journey, recreation of a mythical journey. And for the Sikhs, the most important festival of the year is the commemoration of, of, of uh, the Guru, um, Guru Nanak's birth. And this is commemorated as a Nagar Kirtan, where the book is taken through the streets of Delhi. Here it's going in the opposite direction, comes out to Lahori Gate and goes north to, Guru, to the Gurdwara Nanak Piao. And when you see them all together, oh, here's one more. This is very interesting. Bahadur Shah Zafar instituted the Ram Leela Savari that will circumambulate parts of the city in this way with the grand stage where the Ayodhya is at one end of the stage and Lanka at the opposite end of the stage. And then on the 10th day of the celebration, the effigies of Ravan and his brothers are blown up in this blaze of firecrackers and fire. And after that, on the 12th day, you have this amazing Savari in which the princes of Ayodhya move from Ayodhya to, to Chandni Chok in the middle. Whereas the victorious army of Ram Lakshman and the Vanar Sena, Sena come the other way to meet them at Chandni Chok. And that is where Bharat Milap happens and Ram is welcomed back into Ayodhya. Again, an appropriation of the space of the city as a mythical space. And here you see them all together. So Delhi is also a mythical space. Its main thoroughfares and ceremonial locations are appropriated by different faiths to enact their spiritual journeys. This is perhaps the deepest meaning of the city, an embedded communion of it in its symbolic geography. So peace, pacemakers hark. And don't forget the darwazas of the city, which are now being relegated into just objects protected by archeologists not really as live objects that mean something for the city. And even Horse Kazi and Pavara Chowk are so poorly attended at the moment, being crowded over by traffic. Although Pavara Chowk is now being recovered with the renovation of Chan Nicho. And this flurry of activity which goes around the year produces the specialized markets. Right next to Ramlila ground is a specialized fireworks market. Amazing. Ajit fireworks are renowned. They do all kinds of things for weddings nowadays. They are the ones that produce the fireworks for the Ram Leela and the burning of Ravan. And next to that is Kinari Bazaar, the most amazing bazaar of Kinaris. For your langas, for your patras, for your saris, for your ghagras, for whatever you want. Amazing set of trinkets, anything for wedding, for trousseau, for baby shower and so on and so forth. Tiny shops strewn right across this long bazaar. 
and that is what it leads you to to that corner of chauri bazaar which is a specialized market for wedding cards and here's one announcing himself as shaadi card muslim card manufacturer rate mein milega aapko and itna sasta milega my god fantastic uh, this is an amazing place in itself that has come about in the city and off chauri bazaar yaad nahi sarak if you want a sari if you want a lehenga if you want a suit ah if you want wholesale purchase if you want a uh, retail purchase everything is available and my god the choice and the price range that is available to you another specialized market and nice sarak is also the space where you can buy books books for college books for school and when we were little and we didn't have the internet we could buy a kunji the answer book for your 10th exam and your 12th exam if you ratto the kunji you are through with your exam that's nice sarak for you and here's another specialized market a little further away at lal kuwa the patang market my god what a fantastic place allu bhai is the most famous patang maker and look at the patang he has made for independence day a fantastic patak on the right hand side which says meri jaan hindustan and see the fists at the bottom of this rising at the bottom of the patang so here it is contemporary culture flowering but what is the irony of this situation it is that the shopkeeper and the trader of these amazingly rich and vibrant markets is in some ways blinkered he actually is the first person to resist place making he doesn't look to the street or the convenience of his visitors or or his grahaks he thinks that place making is not his business and he really needs to be convinced but now let me turn to something else it's about the day to day and i'm taking the journeys that were taken by my grandfather chatar bihari his son and my father krishan bihari and me ashok bihari my father and grandfather were in the city most of the time but i by the time i came about i used to take a school bus that came from the south and wended its way through the old city the small streets and what not and came out of the old city to civil lines where i am now living and what i remember of that journey is so fresh in my mind the delhi gate golcha cinema with the mughal e azam poster the smelliest machhi market in the whole world going around a crowded jama masjid and then emerging out of chari bazaar at town hall and eventually and this was wonderful the bus would actually go out of the city through kashmiri darwaza itself which had two gates one for going out and one for coming back in and this on the right hand side is the place where my grandfather had his office he was a lawyer a uh, quite a gracious little design i would say but now it's sold and what's happening opposite this building is what we can see is coming traders are taking over and the whole place is turning into a massive go down well this process is on see the wires see the air conditioners hanging everywhere see the go down being made so isko falak ne loot ke barbaad kar diya hum rehne wale hain isi ujde dayar ke this is meer taqi meer when he leaves delhi out of desperation and goes to lucknow and he tells about his love for delhi and his pain for delhi and this is what is becoming of the city but where there is wealth and where people decide to stay there is life and there is a looking after of the city and on the right you have a big haveli on the left where people have decided to stay on and do it up and live in real style and on the right hand side you have a jain a, a street which has got jain merchants who are jewelers beautiful haveli still looked after and this is the delhi that meer taqi meer came to and he said delhi ka na the ke na the puche aur raakh musavvar the jo shakal nazar aaye tasveer nazar aaye the streets of delhi were not the streets they were like painted pictures 
made by artists. That is how he remembered his fond city. And of course, when there's a lot of wealth with tourism, a seven star reconstructed Haveli, complete with this Dalan, its terraces, its mudra on the right hand side and the Darban and a roof terrace, which you can see the rest of the city from the top with the pigeons flying above you. And here you can see another cityscape, another set of places, wonderful relief from the city. The Patang bars and the Kapudar bars are still thriving. These are the people who live here, for whom the city has real meaning. And there are others who live on the streets, the people who push the tailors and push the cycle rickshaws. But I want you to meet here my friend Sarvjit Singh, to whom I went is to his shop called RK Mohan, which, was, which is for musical instruments, set up in 1940. I went to him to get my old violin repaired. And my goodness, he knew my whole story of childhood. He knew my violin teacher. And he told me so many stories of his youth and his childhood in the city, and a city that he's had to leave. And he thinks that he's going to have to leave the shop too. Look at the way he occupies the pavement. That is his workshop. That is where he meets everyone. That is where his grahak comes and sits. That is where he feeds the little cat that comes visiting him twice a day. But he's sad that that life is over. Kal koi mujko yaad kare, kyon koi mujhe mujko yaad kare. Masroof jamana mere liye kyon wakht apna barwaad kare. Masroof Samana Mere Liye Kyon Vakht Apna Barwaad Kare The whole area has been taken over by motor cars and by the motor cars accessories market. And he is very sad. He has tears in his eyes when he talks of his past. What are the beasts that quash the city's spirit? Its roof, as I should say. Well, it's the railway. Look at this metro line. It's like Godzilla thumping across the city. Look at Kashmiri Darwaza, it's become non-significant. The motor vehicles everywhere. Well, they are being controlled and the electrical infrastructure. On the right top, you see a picture of engineers insisting that the transformer should occupy the middle of Chandni Chowk even while it is being revitalized. Right in front of Fatehpuri Masjid. It's still a battle, not one. And then of course, you have the security infrastructure of gates and barriers everywhere. But this is the promise that we see on the left hand side. And now I want to acknowledge Pradeep Satsdev, who is not with us anymore. He passed away last, last month. The man for two decades worked for this to happen to Chandni Chow. He worked patiently with his convincing smile and pleasant manner with so many stakeholders and said, look, this can be a beautiful place once again. You have to just take the right decisions. And now it is beginning to happen. I really want to acknowledge Pradeep, thank him for all his work. He's a great inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. I was uh, in two minds whether to stop you and tell you that you've slightly <laughs> exceeded your time, but I didn't need to because then okay. you ended. Uh, okay, uh, I believe Aspa is ready to go, but she's going to begin with a film, a short film. So Asba, uh, assuming that you can hear me, please go ahead. Um, I need to also mention that it's good that we are using the language of the uh, North subcontinent because surely we can mix a little bit of Punjabi and Urdu and generally speak Hindustani in the way that she's spoken in these parts of the world. Over to you, Aspa.
Uh, hello, just give me a second. I'll just share the screen. Because I didn't know that I'm going to share that video. Okay. No, if you don't want to, then uh, you don't have to. I mean, it's over to you. It's This is your time. That's it. As per we can't hear the sound, uh, the sound cannot be heard. Is there... Okay, so basically this was a short video made by my friends and we just shared it because it was all related to place making. Okay. Okay, so you can see it. I hope so. Okay, so uh, it's my turn now. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and good evening everyone. I'm Azba Ansari and I'm the founder of Peacemakers Pakistani. I'm an architect, a placemaker and a mental health advocate. Um, so, the, so I'm here to present my insight about how I see Wall City as a traditional settlement and how it offers the opportunities for, for placemaking. But for that, I believe that I must share first how I, how I view placemaking because I believe that different placemakers, different leaders lead projects in a different way. And they see and they perceive placemaking in a different way. Different means bring about different projects. For that, uh, the sequence of my presentation would be how we do it, how Peacemakers Pakistani do it. And for that, I will show you some clips from the, pitch, uh, from the projects we have done. And that will help you understand why we have chosen Wall City as uh, the, to, pre uh, to understand the aspects of placemaking and how I see, because you need to understand my perspective, that how I see that is already happening in the Wall City. And then I'll discuss the initiatives taken by government of Pakistan to enhance and to improve the settlements for tourism and different purposes. And then I'll end, on, end it on a note and we'll go uh, towards the question answer session. Okay, so uh, for me, placemaking is about finding creative solutions to the problems we see. And uh, for that first problem that we had to face was uh, do people are really interested in sharing their, in contributing to their places? For that, we did our first project in Punjab University and the placemaking goals were bringing people together to contribute to their place, making low cost changes and analyzing what works best and how people respond to it. And then there was identifying spaces with the potential of doing wonders and bringing potential together in the greater for the greater benefit then we had the goal for to achieve 
analyzing the demand and need for a space and users by observing the patterns of use and by providing them a place for interaction. And the last goal was, and the last goal was creating a sense of space that is vital by being, bringing attention for the change. And we achieved our goals and it was a success, alhamdulillah. Then the next problem we had was why people throw trash on the streets? Like why can't they keep their cities clean or the areas clean? And for that, we came up with the Fun with Trash campaign and the purpose was to share and to instill, this, uh, instill the habit of recycling and proper waste disposal with students. And for that, we came up with the creative activity with students to turn their waste materials into usable products. Like we did paper mache, we did folding, and we created bags out of newspapers. And we made uh, geometry boxes out of paper pens, uh, out of uh, bottles. And we also did lots of things to improve the environment of the school spaces with the students, of course. And we also used the painted walls to spread the message that save equative life, save oceans. And here you can see the octopus head that was made out of using a shopping bag filled with trash, filled with wrappers. So basically this was how we found uh, the creative weirdo in ourselves through the placemaking activity. And we had tried to work with youth and children that way. So, the, so our, what we have learned through the process is that placemaking and an individual's growth is a lifelong journey that shouldn't be planned or judged, but devised and learned as you move along the path with people you share your region with. And it takes time and it takes effort, definitely. So now heading on to what is the criteria of placemaking? How we find that does it happen with, in all spaces? It happens in the places where there is collective ownership, where there's sense of space, where there is connection with different localities and neighborhoods. It happens in presence of, it happens in the places where there's presence or possibility of third places. And it also happens where there's organic growth. And by that, you can see that we find these things in the wall city of Lahore or in the, in the Asian settlements, you know. Here I have highlighted areas which have, we have worked on, uh, the government have worked on. And these are the places that have been uh, improved at the time. Now I'm heading on to how I, uh, I'm going to share some pictures from Wall City by the artists I really admire. And I, I, I'm very fond of their uh, photography and I'll be sharing what I see in those spaces in terms of placemaking and as an architect and as a placemaker. So the heritage buildings uh, that offer a courtyard or a scare for socialization and for cultural, heritage, uh, cultural activities like social gatherings, bathtubs, food, and other stalls. We, they offer spaces for interaction. This is, this is a picture from Bashai Moss, and we can see that how small details add more meaning to the space in, during daytime and during nighttime. They have different value and different purposes. And it highlights its beauty in a different way and leaves the memory in a different way. Then we have Havelis and the architecture. Havelis left by the Sikhs and the Hindus in the wall city and we still have them. Uh, they're working for different purposes, but the courtyards and the jharokas that, look, uh, that bring people from inside out, we are also maintaining the privacy. These are the places that brings more that brings a connection to people more easily. People who live there and people who are just visitors. Then we have bazaars. It, uh, the wall city streets are filled with shops that are selling items uh, when the display of arts. It, it looks like a display of art because of the colors and all that, but they are tharas. They, the, the shops build tharas along their shops and they are, it is really said that uh, uh, we have extended the shops using tharas because it is for the public interaction. So we see there that uh, sometimes uh, if there is no selling, uh, there is no sale throughout the day, but people are happy because they had the interaction because the shop owners had the interaction with the people and they're happy with that. And then there are the streets. The streets of Wall City are the essence of it. 
it has everything the streets never sleeps be it early morning or the any time of the day you never it's never sleeps and it never stops people from doing anything they want to do the kids playing we see different activities going on and then we have different modes of transportation and we have different levels of interaction we have stairs we have we see benches taras and everything for social interaction we see, and this is the best thing that we have there they are human all the time present and as yangil says that people go to places where people are right and we have we see there are people all the time and the best thing is that we still see how people have been doing things in the past and we still see them doing it the same way the they use physical strength to keep their activities going on and that's how it is a living heritage you know the spontaneous human interaction take place directly or indirectly you ask people and you talk to them then there is sense of belonging be it from the outside to inside or from inside to outside we see people using it the place like they belong to it like they own it and then there is the drama in time be it any time uh the reason i shared these two pictures here at the last is because we are going to discuss the uh, the importance of these two buildings these two sites we are saying there is bashi masjid in the in the background we have urpur road food street the famous food street that tourists uh, are highly attracted to and then we have the royal trail that have been improved and reconstructed over time for the real, tourist attraction our government had improved these areas and the thing is that this a uh, food street area was not having a good value or a good reputation in the past but by giving it a new meaning and new purpose and bringing people to it the place they have changed how people perceive it now it's the most visited place now the tourists go to this place and this is this lively place has turned out to be the greatest uh, economic benefit now and for the and the thing is i would like to ask would you uh, would you ever like such colorful buildings in any other part of the city or you or you just find it appealing because it's part of wall city i think just because it's a part of an ancient city we like it okay so next is the royal trail the royal trail is a shahi guzarga which was used by our uh, mughal emperors and the royalties in the past from where, while coming from delhi to lahore fort and it starts from the league gate and then we have the shahi imam over it the royal bath house where people will where people would take bath and change and then move on to the to meet their mughal emperors in the lahore fort so the what government has done they have laid the infrastructure underground and they have re removed the encroachments and the wire wires up above the building uh, up in the streets okay so it views the it clears the vistas and it open up the street for people and it has the most uh, it has more appealing view for the tourists because tourists usually visit this place and uh, it also has improved the infrastructure and the quality of living for the people living in here the residents here the, it has been a great experience and uh, you can find the details about it on the uh, on the website of wall city lahore authority here is how they have improved the building facade to its nearly possible state now we have shahi imam shahi imam has brought in tourists very well because it's uh, it is one of it is the only structure that is from the persian and iranian and turkish architecture that ha that is present in lahore now so a special contribution has been made to this place for the improvement and reconstruction and the conservation of it see there is a difference and it the project was uh the project was very important and very crucial for pakistan for lahore and here we have wazir uh, khan mosque it the space was encroached by welder shops and different shops but now they have Bigger. and also yeah uh, they have built this street they have changed the street level and now they have recovered the street level from the uh, from the past use and this had created the change that 
the uh, the shops you, the shops you can see the welder shops has been removed and the actual courtyard has achieved and this square is now used for more public interaction and here you have the festival event space uh this is how the space looks when it's lighted and celebrations take place people are here gathering in the place i would end it with the nas our poet saying nasik aadmi says lahore teri ronak ke daim abad teri galiyon ki hawa kheench ke lai mujhko which means that city lahore your magnificence and live forever the wind of your streets has pulled me here this shows how this shows his love for lahore and the streets and this is how i have started working and my dedication for my city lahore because i love its magnificence and its streets thank you i hope thank, I thank you aspa yes you were on time i was about to tell you that you should now start winding up but then you did yeah so that applies to both of us now i i would like to invite all the 90 odd participants who are with us to uh, use the chat and post questions i will typically ask those of you who have posted inter posed interesting questions to um, unmute themselves and speak out their questions so that they can discuss with the relevant speaker um ashok and asba you can you could also address your questions to one or both of them and i'm going to take the privilege of being the moderator by going first and asking the first questions while you people are just um gathering your thoughts um um and that question is and that's really addressed to both of you uh would both of you let me know as an ignoramus almost that are these two world cities and their spaces of any relevance to modern india and pakistan in the 21st century or or are they simply relics of the past which are best um, forgotten whoever wants to go first as well let me give it a shot let me give it a try okay um they are relics of the past which are at best remembered maybe better but i do think that the idea of living in compact towns predominantly pedestrianized with sufficient density so that they have a richness of life and the range of places but also plenty of people living close to where work is so combination of places of ceremony of celebration and places of work places of study and places of home living that combination is a model which we know works even today and it is definitely a model that we need to work on as we go into further urbanization in this subcontinent where urbanization is occurring very fast so i think it's very relevant it is not something to be forgotten it is something to be learned from and built upon hmm. well that is a very satisfying answer um asba would you like to go next yes uh, your question was that the, do these places relate right well i see that uh, the basic difference is wall city has been uh, uh, has been developed over the years over the centuries it has uh, the lahore city the part of wall city is 1000 years old you know the organic growth it has gone through it that's the thing that has built the relation of people and the place it accommodates people well when we, as we compare to in ragavid ragar to the places other settlements of lahore and uh, we see that the space has grown with the use or with the demand but now the settlements are being built on one go they are designed on one on one scale or on the uh, you can say that um, on one model right it is not growth or it no it, it isn't uh, it doesn't take place with the time it doesn't grow with the time so that the, the organic growth is the major major difference and i see that 
uh, wall city has more in, more intricate, more comfort in these places than the other other spaces. That's my answer. No, no, but I, uh, yeah, but I wanted yeah. to ask you a supplementary. Does that yeah. mean that we should learn to design more organically in the modern world as architects? Exactly, we should because this is what will last for for longer time. That's more sustainable and more appealing to people. Uh, as these cities are designed for people and with the human scale, but when we compare them to the no urban settlements, the new ones, of course we have to learn. That's why we are here. Okay. Um... Anisha Minocha has asked a question, which uh, Anisha, if you're listening, could you unmute yourself and ask the question yourself? Um, hello, everyone. Um, and uh, Mr. Lal, very nice to see you. Thank you very much to both speakers for a great presentation. And um, I wanted to know what the level of user and resident engagement was when designing the new places or placemaking in that effort and what level um, the, uh, the residents had a say in, you know, likes, dislikes and how they would have, they would have liked to see um, each of them evolve and preserved. Um, uh, once you want again, to address it to somebody in particular or to both of the speakers? It's a question for both, please. All right. So I can tell you the Delhi case, um, the only significant project that has uh, happened and is happening right now is the one that was led by Pradeep Sachdev. Um, it's required a great deal of close interaction with the shopkeepers associations all along Chandni Chow. They needed to be convinced first of all, and they needed to have their say in determining what is coming. Um, and I was saying that they are the first resistors to change because there is this belief that if the motor car can come up to your shop, then your shop is accessible. There's this kind of something that happened over so many years, a few decades back, you know. Um, but you had to overcome that when you realize that the whole place is getting totally choked and impossible to navigate. And then you have to show, be seen, you have to see examples of what are the alternatives that are possible. And this process of information and giving examples and engaging deeply with the beliefs and desires of all the shopkeepers. Here it was primarily the shopkeepers. The residents who live above the shops or residents who live behind the shops were not part of this particular scheme. And I think that work is now hopefully going to be taken up as we see to the future of our city in Delhi. Lahore, badi ben to hai hi, hume kafi sabak bhi sikha rahi hai. So it's great to see from Lahore how, what public engagement can do. Little places, big places, big action and small action. How it all comes together in a network of activities. Uh, and I think in Lahore, Asma will tell us what is the degree of interaction that happened with the local residents. Yeah, Asma. Uh, okay, so basically the uh, conservation projects that have taken place uh, in Wall City yet is about the, on the Royal Trail, okay? And there was a very much demand about the infrastructure changes because of the exposed infrastructure and that has been laid down and uh, now it's underground. And that was a change that was demanded by residents as well as the tourists. And uh, of course, the government authority has let that change happen because it was needed. And for the city image and for the heritage, for the, heri uh, for the conservation of heritage, it, it was a very important step that was taken by the government. And uh, we are, they have planned to make it happen along the way. And about this, uh, shopkeepers, we say, uh, basically there is thing that some, we need to take, uh, we need to take the permission from the people as well. We have to guide them along the way. Like we need to make changes and we have to guide them also that why it can affect the other people on a greater scale because the tourist attraction can affect the economy in a greater manner. For that, 
this was a step that was taken that uh, people were asked and they were also counseled about changes that needs to be made okay i hope uh, that it is it's okay yeah uh, and if i may be allowed to add a 30 second nugget because i knew pradeep quite well and used to often visit his office and when he was doing this project uh, he had this group of over i think 400 shopkeepers who were resisting a kind of change and he knew them by name he would interact with them practically every week every other week and he often used to just have them just walking into his office call him names or uh, give him some compliment and whatever and and go back to chandni chowk so it was very very deeply personal as a project and for that i must say like ashok i too must thank pradeep for having done what he did he did a completely unusual kind of uh, participatory task in this walled city okay uh, ashwin ashwin tahiliani if you could unmute yourself you have a generalized question which you can ask now yes thank you sp sir as usual always a pleasure to hear uh, sp and uh, ashok sir as well uh, i have a question with respect to the intangible heritage for both the places uh, uh, these, these are just examples that coming you know that are coming to my mind so the fact that there is a galib ki haveli which uh, you associate galib with a certain uh, poetry and that is preserved so people can relive those memories by going to that particular space Uh, apart from these uh, are there any efforts to conserve the intangible in both shahjanabad and lahore thank you asba you start this time <laughs> okay so yes uh, there uh, the thing is the havelis people are living in those places in lahore the uh, the havelis are Uh, they we have the residents in the places okay and the thing is they are using their havelis for social purposes like we have fakir khana museum the fakir khana haveli which is being uh, which have lots of heritage and uh, uh, items stored stored in their uh, in their haveli and it is open to, for public to see and meetings held there and there is other there are other havelis as well like uh, no any housing haveli is being used for victoria school for victoria girls high school and we have chuna mandi haveli being used for this institution purposes and then we have barood khana museum and uh, like we have heritage buildings being used for different purposes so it goes on it is not overlooked it it is being maintained and yes it is also used by media for for, uh, for the photo session and uh, different activities like that which bring more people in and generate more uh social interaction and more interest for the heritage conservation i hope i answered your question uh one of the things that ashwin asked in his question was uh, are there any memories related to ranjit singh in Ra lahore it was his capital for for many decades actually and ashok I will okay. visit. We know that there is the the space for dedicated built by him. Hmm. We have that uh, we have that saying that uh, we we share the we have the very much respect for Sir so Rajiv Singh for not destroying the uh, Mughal Emperor spaces built before it, because hmm. he had let them stay and he had built their own structures uh, besides the Mughal states. And we have the Rajiv Singh Samadhi as well. We have the spaces, and yes, of course, the architecture built by six. That's what we are using now, na. Mm -hmm. So we still have the spaces kept. He also well, asks, as a corollary, that there is the fact that Parvez Musharraf was born in Shah Jahanabad. Is there? <laughs> <laughs> is there any? Yeah, that's very interesting. <laughs> well, let me let me tell you about uh, the. The heritage that is, what do you call it? Intangible uh, heritage. Intangible heritage. Yeah. Well, 
Unfortunately, what has happened, and I think the cause of this whole thing is the coming of the railway station, which made it convenient for lots of goods to come and go. Uh, the city got overtaken by wholesale trade. Mm. And gradually the residents moved out, except for those who were either extremely wealthy and wanted to keep their old places, or those who remain as poor citizens who don't have an option to go anywhere else. And so with that dominant culture of commerce and trade overtaking the fabric of the city, the whole notion of the intangible heritage has got suppressed. And it is, there is now an effort to recover some of that. And I was referring to that when I talked about the processions that occupy the streets and places of the city as significant appropriations of a cultural imagination that needs to be encoded in the physical space and recognized in the physical space. It's a great gesture. It is a gesture to the rest of the city and to all cultures to have something like that. Equally, when you talk of all the, all the poets and all other personalities, including Musharraf Saab, Musharraf Saab, and uh, you know, there are many other people like Ansari um, and Jinnah and all that. There, were, there are lots of people who are associated with the city and there can be places which are then, that commemorate them, locations that commemorate them. And gradually you can pick up the historical background of the city to recognize what the depth of its culture was and begin again to enjoy it. So I think there is a beginning in Shahjanabad, in Delhi, of now engaging the greater city, the Delhiites, into the joy of the old city. There is a beginning. Okay, uh, a quick and trivial kind of questions to, to both of you, uh, and maybe to Vinita as well. Uh, comes from Suvarna Jain. I'll just read it because it's such a short question. Would it be wise to add Amritsar as the third sister? Does anybody know about Amritsar? To be able to answer that? A little bit. A little bit, yes, because Amritsar is on the way hmm. between, between Lahore and Delhi. Hmm. Uh, it's not a sister in the same sense because you have the kilas and the royal seats and this wonderful kind of symbolic geography that on the western side of Lahore, uh, you have the Ravi River. Hmm. And on the eastern side of Delhi, you have the Jamna River. Hmm. And the two rivers actually hold the plains in between with the two seats of power facing one another at the opposite ends, uh, really establishes a uh, fantastic kind of relationship. Oh. So Amritsar is actually on the way. Uh, it's the place where the Sikhs have held sway. And of course, the Golden Temple is a great place in itself. Um, and as a, as a place, which is the, the home of the Golden Temple, the center of Sikh, Sikhism today, I think Amritsar has great value you enter the Golden Temple precincts and you are transported into a, some sort of a piece of a spiritual space. Um, and that really is, there's a syncretic quality between in Amritsar, which brings together the two other cultures. It's very beautiful actually. Very well said. Asba, would you like to comment on something? Uh, since I haven't visited, I won't be able to comment on that. Okay. But yeah, I have. I would say that, that Lahore and Delhi resembles in, in urban fabric in the case of all city. Well, I have read that Agra might resemble Lahore and Delhi. I would learn, mm -hmm. like to learn about that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Kushal Lachwani has asked an interesting question and we really are running out of time. So we should start winding up and probably, I mean, I have lots of questions. It's very difficult to start uh, excising them. I'm kind of looking at these questions here and uh, I think after this, we'll go with just one more. Just somebody to, who I have. It's fine to carry on. Uh, 
Oh, it's fine to carry on, Sanjay, if you're if you're okay with mm -hmm. it and the speakers. So. No, I'm fine. Yes, I'm free. Are are the two of you fine? Mm -hmm. Yes. We are. We're okay. Okay. If our hosts are happy, we're, we're... <laughs> so Kushal Lachwani has a question. Please unmute yourself and ask. Hi everyone. Uh, hello Ashok sir. Good to see you after a long time. Hello Asba. Uh, thank you for both of your presentations. I was just curious if either of you had an opportunity to visit uh, both Lahore and Old Delhi uh, at any point of time in your life. And uh, would you be able to see any kind of differences how each of them have evolved at a different pace or just differently evolved because of the attitude of the people or the government towards their own heritage. Uh, because from the pictures, it looks, uh, of course, uh, some similarities, but I'm just curious if either of you had a chance to go to both of the cities or maybe anyone else in the participant list. Well, um, I wasn't able to go to Lahore, although I was invited just last year to attend a conference on housing. So was Sanjay, but it didn't happen. Somehow we didn't, we, because it got postponed and whatever. And I thought that was an opportunity of a lifetime. Yes, I had but, said yes. Yeah, but my wife, Ayn, has had the opportunity of going to Lahore and she's been living in Delhi for a long time. And she says, if you want to know what Delhi can be, please go and see Lahore. Body band to Lahore he hai. You know, learn from Lahore. Yes, so I think Lahore is, is in some ways because it has remained, I think, a relatively more residential space, uh, not an active commercial hub the way Delhi has become overtaken. And I think I think come come keep coming back to this railway station story. If the, if the railways of Delhi decided not to offload goods at Delhi railway station, things will begin to change and will return to a more balanced kind of city. That may be a possibility in that direction. But there's a big difference in the approaches and attitudes of the state uh, in Lahore as compared to Delhi. The Delhi, the national government or the Delhi government is not that much exercise about the old city of Delhi. Not really that much exercise. It takes a lot of push and pressure. And I must say, although we have a Shah Jahanabad Development Authority, but it has all kinds of other interests up its sleeves of malls and parking lots and underground parking and God knows what else. They are really not talking about the spirit of the city of Delhi. There's a big difference between Lahore and Delhi that way. So, um, Asba, if you want to go. Yeah, uh, of course, I haven't been to Delhi. But uh, from the talk of uh, Mr. Ashok, I would like to mention here that we say Lahore is, Lahore, one city of Lahore is a living heritage. The purpose is because it was used for residential purposes before and was used for residential purposes after partition as well. And what I love about that people living in that place is that they have the emotion connection to that place, you know? Uh, they have been migrated from a place, they left their homes and they were welcomed here, here in the wall city in different residential, in the residential area built by the Sikhs and the Hindus. It embraced them, it created room for them, for their shelter. That's how the, the living heritage is still on because people have an emotional connection for them. They are thankful for it and we see in their body language at, as well that behavior that legacy is still we can see there when we communicate with people they are thankful for it and they are very much concerned about its preservation and for its long longevity the difference mm. in delhi and lahore thank you you know it's getting to be 10 o'clock in india so i'm afraid i'll have to kind of put some kind of time limits to this whole interaction interesting though it may be and it, we won't go on till midnight. Uh, so I'm going to call upon Riddhi Batra to ask her question next. Riddhi, if you can hear me. Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much. This was a great talk. It was so nice to hear about Delhi and Lahore. And Old Delhi is a place that's 
very close to my heart. So um, it was lovely to hear about it, uh, Mr. Lal, and to hear about um, Azba's work in Lahore as well. So um, my question, I'll just read it out loud, is um, on designing a sense of belonging in place, uh, what was interesting to note was Azba's point of thinking of the place's purpose and meaning. But as cities evolve and grow, how can that sense of purpose, which uh, we're looking towards the present or the future, how can it be reconciled with what it might have been in the past? So um, like we were talking about metro stations uh, and how that's completely changed the character of Kashmiri Gate and the entire area around it. Um, but some might say that development is absolutely essential and um, we have to look at uh, urban growth as well. So how can we design for urban growth while keeping the character of a place in mind? I would request Mr. Ashok to go first so I can process it for in the time being. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, very, very valid point that you raised, Riddhi. Um, yes, um, every, sh you know, that this, this is interesting because now, all those shops where you, the Kinari Bazaar, Nai Sadak, the shops where you can order your wedding cards, etc., or Chauri Bazaar and many other shops, all the markets, they are all on internet. You can reach the shop on internet. They can quote on internet. They will show you the samples on internet. They will take your orders and then they will deliver the stuff to your home. So where the infrastructure is not intrusive on the physical space, it's easy for it to be incorporated and it enlivens, in fact, it gives a fillip to the ongoing trade and interaction with the city, uh, within the city and with people outside the city. But if it continues to be used as warehousing, we have a problem. So if Wholesale trade is modern. It certainly is not something that can be housed in this fabric. It has simply overtaken it. So that kind of modernization, you have to understand what the implications are going to be. When the first wires and electrical cables arrived, my God, people didn't know how to handle them. Even sewage pipes or water pipes, people didn't know how to handle them. They would be hanging everywhere. They still do. And I think, you know what, that the engineering trades, and still this is the big problem, whether it is traffic engineering, transportation engineering, electrical engineering, water engineering, sewage engineering, they need to go through some sort of a, I don't know what kind of orientation program, training program, cultural program, to understand where engineering belongs in the making of places and cities. It is not merely a hardware that can be lumped anywhere. And that is something, it's a matter of a hierarchy of design values, which is then shared. Unfortunately, municipalities are driven by engineers who couldn't give a damn about what the buildings and spaces are like. And it takes a lot of doing for them to be brought around. So, um, yeah, thank you. Dalrymple has an interesting uh, anecdote about the old city uh, in his book, The Last Mughal, which is about Badr Shah Zafar, the poet king. And see, when they exiled him to Burma, the British decided to use the swanking new station of Old Delhi, which had just come about uh, in 1957, 1857, I'm sorry. And uh, so he was taken on a train to Burma to be exiled there. And he said in his poetic way that uh, you have to watch that this doesn't become the way that the city is run because that's no way for it to go. So he was prescient, I, I suppose, in, in many ways about this. Uh, by the way, Astha Khatri had a similar question and I hope that at least Ashok has partly addressed this. And I don't know if Asba would like to take a go at a stab at an answer. Uh, I would like to mention here that uh, we are still learning about it basically. 
secondly we have i would like to say that the the presentation uh, the presentation i gave i have the slide there about the basic criteria for place picking that the points that i mentioned there were actually about the places that are successful and that have the qualities that must be learned from wall city so you can the we, uh, the urban planners or designers must learn those as those practices as their priority while they design different spaces onwards i believe that if we have some of this, those points in consideration before we design further it might be helpful it might be achievable to build cities for people rather than for cars as they say um, i'm going to go with sumedha jain's question sumedha if you if you are still around in the yeah, 70 uh, or can you hear me yes yeah so i think i'll just read out what i type uh, so i'm an architect urban designer and uh, the thank you for the presentation i totally find myself in sync with what miss aswa had stated that people really uh, want place making so the, the question do do people really want place making so i we have been working with charjana bath for some time and uh, i have been continuously uh, we, we have been facing this difficulty where we do not hear people's voices enough so we do not get a you point on to as in whether they really want things how do they want things because they, uh, there's a lot of multiplicity in the area as mr lal explained so my question to mr lal i'm so sorry it's so specific is in your experience do people really want place making in shahjana bad and are they happy with all this complex clearing that happens or is it just uh, a very piecemeal approach that is being followed in city building shahjana bad building process yeah well it always depends on who you speak with um the the very there's a large very poor population that is still living in the rare streets behind balli maran and that area uh in the kashmiri gate area and so on very poor population is living there if you talk to them about place making they don't know what you're talking about because they are just coping with their day to day making a living having a place to work having a place to stay uh and being in the heart of the city even though it is in a terrible condition we still have access we have access to transport they have access to some facilities they have access to schools and so on and to even medical facilities um so you know it is a real question of poverty first how do you rekindle the economic engine of the city where people can feel their own value and worth and grow with the change of the city it is when that is overcome that you begin to care passionately for the for the dalan of your haveli because otherwise the dalan of your haveli has been divided into four already because there are so many families wanting to squeeze themselves in so i think um it depends on who you talk with and i think it really requires an economic and social regeneration of those who inhabit the old city and you have to pick it up from the bootstraps start working from the bottom to see to find what the key is to this problem and not again i want to repeat this not to be pushed out by commercial interest the city will become a dead city and nothing but a warehouse if you don't watch it yes um okay uh, i'm not going to take over questions which for whom answers can be found on wikipedia or on the internet so i mean there are somebody who asked about whether what kind of walls these are and this can be researched very easily um uh, instead i'm going to go ahead with olga who is not from india or from pakistan and uh, she has a question for each one of you so go ahead olga uh, many thanks sanjay uh, for for this opportunity and uh, thank you so much for uh, ashok and asbai it's been really really exciting to 
uh, to listen to both of you. So I have uh, different questions for each speaker. So to Asba, you know, I was quite amazed by the quality of the interventions in, uh, in Lahore. And uh, I was wondering how was it all funded? Uh, because these interventions are quite elaborate. And in continuation of this, I was wondering uh, what was the uh, status of the other historic cores uh, in Pakistan? Whether they benefited from something similar or does it lag behind uh, to, to a large extent? And uh, before Sanjay cuts on me later, I just want to say my question to Ashok as well. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, my question to Ashok is more on your first comment when you commented a little bit on the model for, for cities to, to develop today. And I'm wondering what would be the best aspirational urban development model for Indian cities? Uh, because we could say the historic core model, if maintained well, could be a model, but I feel that's not what people aspire to today. Now, what we get today, is it aspirational? I very much doubt so either. So is there any kind of blend between the old and the new that would create that kind of aspirational Indian urban development model? Asba first, Asba first. Okay, so uh, thank you Olga for asking me this question. Uh, basically, this was a project done by government of Pakistan, and yes, you may, you have found that it was uh, it was it, the improvements were done very intricate, and the budget was of course very much high, and it was internationally funded with the help of uh, aid, and you can find the details in on the Wall City Authority website because I'm not into that too much, but. I would like to mention here, it was funded internationally because uh, these were the infrastructure projects. Like, you know, it wasn't the lesser, lighter, quicker, cheaper projects or just handling people. It was about countries' economy. It was about the major interventions. The projects like these are important for the, uh, for the conservation and reconstruction of certain areas. And it takes time and it takes a lot of money to do it. But it was important because the tour for the tourist uh, tourist attraction and for the purpose of conserving the heritage sites because it over the centuries it was uh, uh, destroyed. So that's why uh, we can't compare how we can't just dive in about how normal people take it because I can't do it. Of course, on myself, it was uh, government funded. I hope you got answer. Hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll go now to answer your question. Um, of course, it's not about a romantic recreation of places like the old city, about the narrow winding streets and the beautiful architecture and so on and so forth. It's not, it's not about a romantic recreation. That's not necessarily what we are, I'm referring to. If you were to look at the aspirational aspects of the city. Let's first of all see who, which section of society we are referring to when we talk of aspiration. If you are looking at the top 5% very rich international world citizen, their aspiration is to have a penthouse on a multi-story building with a Mercedes parked in the garage below and a golf course to look on to. That's them and let them be. For God's sake, just let them be. But if you're talking about the half of the city, which does not have that aspiration, but would like to have safe, secure living, environmental comfort, care for the environment around you, open space for the children, quiet and safety, some greenery, and accessibility and mobility provided, I think, the majority of the population actually aspires to that. And that gives you a possible model. And today, because of our skewed planning regulations, you cannot reproduce that kind of city in new developments because of stupid planning regulations about widths of streets and setbacks and what have you. But still, I think in affordable housing estates, 
let's say for, for instance, my firm is trying to do, we try to learn from the example of places like Shah Janabad, or if you go to the old European quarters, take Paris or parts of Berlin, or if you take Barcelona uh, and so on, which are, which are modern cities with modern infrastructure and so on, but they still have the notion of compactness and not very tall and a, and a feeling of living in what you might call a habitable urban space the streets and the squares. Those are the patterns that we are talking about. They are still to be built for our new cities for people to begin to appreciate that. That opportunity has to be constructed. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, see most of the people watching are from India and therefore also most of the questions seem to be from people in India. But uh, I'd like to ask if there is somebody listening in from Pakistan who has a question. I, I, I'm having to judge by names on the screen in front of me. And I'm sorry if I'm misjudging anything, but Shajia, are you, is that the right pronunciation and are you from Pakistan? Uh, I'm from Pakistan and I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Asma and uh, Sir Ashok for the amazing presentation. Uh, but I think the rate at which uh, the development is going in Delhi and also in Lahore, uh, do it doesn't seem to you like uh, the the essence of placemaking is losing or the vibrancy which we have once in our wall city uh, is now losing its uh, aspect. Matlab, I, I'm also an architect, but I think that we are losing this uh, uh, vibrant colors and the uh, people they're interacting and the basic essence of place making there because we are losing it to infrastructure and all the modern development. Yeah, certainly I think uh, uh, we have the, the momentum of the culture based on the city of the motor car that was inherited some four or five decades ago. That momentum is still is catapulting us into our immediate futures. Um, and that is, you're absolutely right. So long as that momentum Sir, you have muted. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Ah, as long as that momentum you were saying? Okay, so I did something in the between. I'm playing tabla. <laughs> <laughs> so as long as that momentum persists, we are the losers. We're not going to have cities that we can call places. We're going to have cities that we can call parking lots and motorways. Um, but I think some learning is occurring now. And there is a possibility, there's a potential of a turnaround where we begin to think of cities not as infrastructure, but as places and homes, as places that we can feel that we can belong to, places that we can appropriate with our imagination of what it can mean for us. I have a feeling that we are on the brink of that new culture, but we have to make our efforts to communicate it to as many people as possible. And Asba, would you like to take that question as well? Yes, uh, I think uh, from being from Pakistan, I can understand what you meant. Maybe uh, the changes that have been made now, like the there are uh, changes in infrastructure. I guess people are new to that change because over the years we have seen wires and the structures in different manner, right? Uh, and after the change, we see them from the time that it was used to be from the centuries ago. You know, people are people have to adopt to that time now. So it's a change for them. They might think that we are losing the uh, we are losing the cultural heritage in that manner. No, we are restoring it to what it used to be because it's a living heritage. We have to relate it to how it used to be, and we have to accept that as a change. I guess I, that was something she meant. Okay. We aren't losing it, and of course, space making is an ongoing process. Over the time, the demands will change. 
the association with the place and the image of the of the place would also change we have to accept it with the time it takes time okay uh, we've gone well over a one and a half hour deadline so i'm going to just ask uh, one more question and this is to somebody who is also not from india or pakistan uh, ethan kent would you go next um yeah, hi everyone thanks for squeezing me in at the end appreciate it uh, what a rich conversation um i i'm i'm not obviously not from india i have got to spend time in 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 old delhi and i've long uh, been inspired by the work of asba and ansari and um with with peacemakers pakistan um and I, I just want to point out i think this is this is you know it's, it's so inspiring this conversation is happening to many you know for for many of us um, from outside of, of that region. Um, there's also lots of ways this can connect and inform uh, global placemaking conversations. Certainly, you know, many people uh, understand and respect the need to learn from these historic cores, um, need to not glorify them as well. Um, but the challenges that are being faced there are, are um, you know, microcosms and sometimes amplifications of the challenges being faced in similar historic cores around, around the world. Um, you know, our work with Placeback Next is really networking and connecting these conversations globally. So we'd love to, to, to connect you uh, to inspire others, but also to learn from challenges that you're, you're facing that other communities, similar communities may be dealing with. Um, the peacemaking process is something, the, the connection between peacemaking and placemaking is a topic that many people are increasingly interested in around the world and gain, coming at it from very different perspectives and different, different angles um, that you know, I'd love to, to further connect people on um, obviously, the historic preservation one focuses on on vending and markets. How how healthy cities have a full spectrum of informal to formal vending and and retail is an exciting topic. Um, but this, but just my my last question is just um, you know how how can the global placemaking community and how can uh, we all help form communities that support placemaking on, in in these historic cores in these walled cities as well? What what can be done? What was an action point, perhaps, from this conversation um, for for the people on the call, and how do we get others involved to help preserve and sustain these historic cores going forward? Uh, by that, do you mean uh, whether um, the challenge is financial, or whether it is informational, or and so on, or simply yeah, a lot of whatever today. obstacles or limiting factors? Yeah, how can how can the placemaking community support? support these um, these areas going forward. So there you have it. Asba or Ashok, just uh, maybe half a minute each. What yeah. you would like to see? 15 seconds, the placemaking community can come and show to the people of the city, the old city, to the people who manage and look after the old city and to the government, its traders, the potential or what it can be and to show that it has been achieved in many other parts of the world uh, who have brought themselves out of a stage of dilapidation and decay into a fuller rich beautiful life that mm -hmm. demonstration as as a blitz of information of, of communication around the city and with the city and its managers is what your community can definitely do immediately, starting today. <laughs> Thanks. Beautiful. First of all, thank you, Ethan, for connecting us uh, initially. And secondly, uh, I have just started my research on the wall city and how the placemaking can happen here. Uh, and you know, I, wa I will be asking you questions through mail and everything. Uh, but definitely we would, I would like my, my audience here, the people from Pakistan, from Lahore, to show interest in their places. That's the first goal. And uh, I'm doing it through connecting and through building material on my own platform. And yes, we are I have learned a lot from your platform, from your tools and guidelines you have given. And further, of course, uh, as I devise some method or something to work on, I will get back to you. I can't say anything for now because I don't know how it's going to go because it's a time learning process. It goes with time. I'm into it. I'll bring something out, inshallah. Great. Um, with that, I have to give all manners of congratulations to 
the people from Pakistan who are listening in for their Independence Day, the 73rd anniversary of their independence, and uh, to people listening in from India for their Independence Day, which will be what one and a half or one and a three quarters hours from now, and uh, hand over back to Vinita. Thank you, Sanjay, uh, for brilliantly. I don't know. You, it's been a long day for you because you started uh, with this uh, seminar, online seminar with the National University of Singapore, and you ended the day with uh, you know a, a really long slog. Thank you so much. This has been a hugely gratifying uh, you know evening, uh, and thank you so much to all the participants from Pakistan and uh, in various parts of India who who made time to be here. We had 95 participants and now down to 50, 59, 60. <laughs> and uh, I, I can't thank you enough for, um, for making this a really vibrant, we wish we could have answered all the questions. Uh, but this session will be on our YouTube channel of uh, Placemaking India. Um, and uh, it, it possibly in, in a day's time. So feel free, there's so much rich material here, especially the presentations. Uh, and there's, there's a lot to review. Um, I hope we can keep the conversation going, perhaps mm -hmm. another session of Karachi in Bombay. Uh, you know, that's a possibility uh, in, in due course. And uh, we, can, you know, we, we hope to build bridges with uh, all the South Asian countries and, uh, you know, invite you to our Placemaking Week India, which happens next December. Uh, and that will be in Mangaluru in South, Southwest India. Um, so once again, uh, thank you to everybody. It's speakers, you were, you were tremendous. And Sanjay, thank you again. And Ethan, you be I, I need to just ask you very, quick, very yes, quickly, sure. Sure. a housekeeping kind of uh, question. Mm -hmm. can, these, can all these questions in the chat room be saved? Yes, uh, actually, when I download at the end of this meeting, the chat questions will also download. So okay. they can be made available uh, to the speakers. And I'm, I'm not sure how we can post them uh, because we have a YouTube channel, but um, I'm not sure. But if, if anybody's interested, please get in touch with me. Um, and um, if you're interested in, or, or we can post them to the speakers. And if you're interested in following up, uh, the speakers, um, I would ask Asba and Ashok, maybe you can just uh, in the chat box, you can, you can provide your email IDs so that people can follow up with, uh, follow up with you individually. Uh, yeah. So Asba. That would be very useful. Take a minute. Because you are, by default, you are writing to everybody. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you can you just can take just a minute, uh, Asba, to uh, put your, in the chat box, put your email uh, ID down. Uh, um, and uh, Ethan, of course, I, I'm, I'm so delighted you stayed with us till the end and you've been a great inspiration for 16 such networks around the world. And, uh, um, you know, it's been personally gratifying experience for me to have organized Urban Jam and, uh, you know, your, your constant inspiration and encouragement has meant, meant a lot to, to us. Thank you so much for that, Ethan. So, Thank you so much. Uh, Ashok, you, guys, you guys are the inspiring ones. Thank you. <laughs> Ashok, uh, your mail ID hasn't come in, though I can see Asba has typed hers in. Ashok's uh, email ID is here. Yeah. I have typed it in, but I don't know how to send it. Uh, uh, just press just enter. Call it out. Call it out. Oh, press enter. Yeah. <laughs> Is it done? No, not yet. To everyone, Ashok Bilal at uh, gmail.com. Ashok you write it in. Ashok Bilal at gmail.com. Gmail That's A S H O K B L A L L at gmail.com. And as far as. Yeah. And okay. as far as. I'm typing it. I'm typing it for you. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. That's right. That's there you go. So that's peacemakerspakistani at gmail.com and ashokbilal at gmail.com. Okay. Thank you so much and uh, wish you all a really 
you know, a great Independence Day to people in India and, uh, and uh, we, continue, we continue the dialogue. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank okay, bye-bye. Thank you all bye. very much. Good Good night. Thank you, everyone. Allah. Allah Hafiz. <laughs>Asba, uh, were you were you happy with the, the way things went? You're